Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone who is joining us for today's fantastic webinar, which will focus on the multi-vehicle collaboration capabilities of our self-driving car research studio. My name is Armin Mulkey, and together with my colleagues, Mr. Paul Karam, Director of Engineering at Quanser, and Quanser's Research and Development Engineers, Dr. Gilbert Lay and Mr. John Pinaros, we will be your hosts and webinar moderators. And with that, I'll pass the microphone to Paul. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Armin, and thank you everybody for uh, for making time today. I know uh, everyone's quite busy these days and, um, uh, you know, with, with everything going on. And I think uh, hopefully by the end of this webinar, you'll get a glimpse over sort of how we're continue to develop, um, you know, given the challenges that this pandemic has, has given us, but still um, making progress nonetheless and, and finding more innovative and, and uh, you know, new ways to continue our research and, uh, and push the boundaries of what's, uh, what's possible in this exciting space of um, self-driving cars. And in particular, for today, I'm going to really focus on, or at least try to focus on, the intercommunication, the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle, um, and the vehicle-to-infrastructure communication around that. So thank you once again, and uh, please feel free to, to ask us uh, any questions. I'm going to try to keep the, the description or, and the, uh, the, the demonstrations fairly brief, so we leave ample time for questions. I know I'm going to be sh uh, showing quite a few different uh, configurations and, and developments along the way, um, and, and I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to, to, to many uh, questions that you might have over what, uh, you know, what, what I'll be presenting. So I will start uh, today today's presentation with fairly simple um, diagram. So this is, uh, and, and you'll get to see um, where this comes from. So this is, for, for those of you who aren't aware, this is sort of an outline of a hockey rink, actually. Uh, and the reason I, I put that in here, because as I'm now uh, working remotely and not in the office, I've taken over my children's hockey rink in the basement. And that's now become my, uh, my half hockey rink and half uh, research studio of our self-driving car and uh, to to really highlight some of the capabilities and in particular the communication capabilities of uh, the self-driving car research studio i wanted to propose a, a challenge to myself and then to to us as uh, you know as quanser can i develop a set of algorithms so that i have multiple vehicles in this case two vehicles driving in a uh, in, in the common space in this case in my basement in, in the hockey you know de facto hockey rink in my basement and can i command them to go to various locations and crisscross their paths with the goal of eventually i e you know having them communicate with one another um so that they avoid collisions and they can navigate and, and achieve their goals without uh, incident and, and uh, with as much information as possible. So that, that was the overall sort of goal uh, or challenge, if you will, that I uh, challenged uh, ourselves and, and myself in particular to try to get to and to demonstrate for this webinar. So hopefully, um, as I walk through the experience and, and where we got to, you'll get a glimpse of some of the capabilities and some of the options you will have as research groups and researchers in this exciting field of what possibilities are there um, when you deploy this type of architecture uh, for your research. So the hypothesis here was I will have two vehicles, um, two of our Quantra Q cars, and I'll get into sort of more descriptions on, on what it is exactly in a little bit. But basically, um, like, like many of our research products, this is a mobile computing platform. Uh, it's, it happens to be on four wheels, and that's why we call it the Q car. But really, you know, what we've done is develop our own high fidelity, high performance uh, computing pl platform with, with a ton of, uh, you know, many sensors that are relevant to the self-driving car or, uh, you know, autonomous space, um, and also allowed for varying uh, software environments to access that information and to control the, the car or, or vehicles over and above it. Um, as we started development of this platform a few years ago, one of the key uh, development choices was to support not just the MATLAB Simulink environment that we typically do for many of our systems, but to also look at other um, environments that are very, you know, uh, that have progressed quite well in this space, namely Python, ROS, um, and so on. So if, for, for this particular um, application, I was hoping to rely on on ROS as being the engine or the component that would 
give me some self-localization. So basically tell me, tells each car, I have Ross running on the car, and I was implementing, we were, we were implementing a Hector Slam algorithm there that would basically give it some self-localization. So the, depending on where you start and as you move around a given space, it would tell you your relative position from that start. Uh, on and I was going to run that same algorithm on both cars and my you know initial hypothesis was that if I started both of them at known locations with the with those coordinates then I'd be able to you know extract a global reference frame for both cars to operate in and then the the rest of it I was going to use that loss information to publish it to uh, my MATLAB or Simulink application and do some more fusion along the side of that um, in, in Simulink and then finally have that information communicated with one vehicle to the other. Um, unfortunately, as I was developing this and, and leveraging, uh, you know, the Hector Slam algorithm, me being more, uh, you know, uh, along the MATLAB Simulink uh, line, I wasn't comfortable in going down to the ROS level and debugging uh, algorithms uh, in ROS. Um, I'm sure if we were back in the office and I had the, the full teams uh, attention, we would be able to to handle any discrepancies that I was finding. But given the the remote work, it was a bit challenging. And plus, I took the challenge onto myself to say, you know, now that I have, I know what I what I need to do, and I believe that the the tools do exist in the MATLAB and Simulink environment. Let me go on and try to uh, to try to do this the localization myself, utilizing some of these toolboxes, and put the the ROS implementation to the side for now, as because I'm not particularly a ROS expert, and uh, and this was a, an opportunity for me to really learn um, how much I could actually push the uh, the navigation toolbox. And so I started, you know, said, okay, let's start from scratch. And and the challenge really was now, can I leverage this, uh, you know, navigation toolbox from the MathWorks? and take advantage of some of its great capabilities, albeit a lot of its post-processing or, or offline processing, can I leverage some of those functions and implement them in real time um, as the cars are driving around to, to achieve the, that overall objective of uh, globally localizing both vehicles? Um, it was probably a little ambitious, as, uh, as, as I've, uh, you know, some late nights have, uh, have told me, but uh, at the end of it, uh, you know, as you will see as I progress through this presentation, it was all worthwhile, and, and I, I learned a lot from it as well, and, and I was able to uh, really highlight some of the uh, interesting capabilities over and above what we uh, currently provide on our uh, self-driving car research studio, um, and really explore um, some future, you know, applications of the navigation toolbox. All right, so before I, I dive, uh, you know, more so into the algorithm and sort of my experience of developing this application, I just want to just take a, a second to pause, and I'm not sure how many of uh, of you are, are well aware of Quanser, but for those of you who aren't, um, just want to introduce who Quanser is. So Quanser is, uh, we are an academically focused company. Uh, all we do is uh, is provide solutions for engineering universities in both the undergrad and the research space. Our name comes from uh, the amalgamation of question and answer, and that's where you get Quanser. And so that really forms the basis of what we believe in, what we stand for, the fact that all we do is academia and everything that we do is academically targeted for both undergraduate teaching and graduate research. Um, we've been in, in this uh, business for over 30 years. We're based uh, just outside of Toronto, Canada, and, uh, and, and we're you know, a global, global company in that regard. Um, and we've, uh, you know, ever since our first product, the one that you see on the left there, um, that really, you know, w was targeted to bring the, the, you know, fairly mathematical and abstract concepts of control systems to reality. And, and really, you know, one of our, our uh, pillars that we, uh, we build upon is bringing theory to life. And, and, you know, that was our pillar 30 years ago, and that is still our pillar now. You see what we do as we release our, our more uh, forward-looking research platform, like our Quanser drone on the right here, and now the Quanser car, the Q car. It's still based on that same premise. We want to provide a robust, open architecture platform that will allow you to really highlight some of these really emerging and challenging concepts of localization of control systems, of automation, and how do you actually provide both an undergraduate um, you know, student uh, an experience on something you see on the left there, or your whole research group an experience to really push the boundaries of the theory 
um, within this exciting field and actually get some real um, you know, physical hands-on experiences. So um, the, the, the center of uh, this particular offering, the, the self-driving car research studio, is the Quantra Q car. And this is what uh, I'll be using here uh, to develop it. I, as you can see, it is a, f uh, a fairly robust and, and well-instrumented platform. Um, I do refer to it very much so as a, a computer on wheels. We, we did make sure that that's, uh, you know, that is what all our customers and all our partners uh, want from us. They want to have a highly performant uh, system that they can um, uh, implement any algorithm. Just like I had an idea, I had a hypothesis, and I needed to, to challenge it and see um, was I able to achieve what I set out to do. And this is why this is a, a great platform to do exactly that. Um, at the heart of it is the NVIDIA Jetson TX2 processor, and that's really, uh, you know, when you, when you look at the space of self-driving car or autonomous systems in general, um, you know, the NVIDIA platforms really uh, stand out as being leaders of the pack because they provide fantastic processing capabilities, and they couple that with the, their GPU technology that they're known for, and the two together really uh, allow you to push the boundaries of, uh, of the research. Um, around the car, you know, we we really um, overly instrumented it in the sense that we have a 360 degree view of cameras. We have four cameras that you can stitch together to get full 360 view. We have a forward facing Intel RealSense RGB and, and depth camera. And then what I've really focused on uh, for this application is this 2D lidar on the top here. And and you know, as much as I knew. Uh, a little bit about lidar technology uh, in the past. What I what I experienced uh, over the last few weeks in putting this uh, webinar together um, was really, you know, a, a deeper appreciation of the capabilities and and, and you know uh, benefits of having uh, lidar augment everything else that we put on the car. And then finally, you know, with this particular studio, um, you know, we really wanted to push the boundaries of our software environment. You know, we traditionally at Quanser have always uh, you know, led with the MATLAB and Simulink uh, environment for, for many reasons, as we, you know, a lot of our products started in the control systems robotics field. But now as we start to explore and and, and uh, go into more emerging fields, especially something like self-driving cars or machine learning and AI, there are there are other tools that are, uh, our customers are asking us to use that they're comfortable in. And so we ambitiously set out at the onset of this uh, studio development to support not just the MATLAB Simulink, but to have a lot of great native support for things like Python, Ross, C++, TensorFlow, and so on. And so our, our vision and, and what we've realized is just like I was planning on doing and actually achieved as well, you can actually have various uh, you know, subsets of your research group working in their environment of choice. So if you have uh, a few experts in ROS that have a particular application, they can develop and continue to develop that ROS application and have it communicate on the car with other applications running possibly in Python or MATLAB Simulink and so on. And so this versatility was also at the heart of um, what, what I hope you can take out of this webinar as well. And then finally, you know, a big part of our, um, you know, studio offering is various roadways to allow you to look at and, and set up different configurations. We also augment this with signage and, and different, um, you know, peripherals that will help you do different scenarios in, for your application as well. But without further ado, let's go back to the task at hand. And so, um, you know, I took the uh, ambitious challenge of, of, of trying to, to really learn navigation myself and get a deeper understanding and then pushing the envelope and trying to implement these offline tools and to have them um, you know do something of interest like the the original task I presented or hypothesized um, in real time or uh, you know online uh, while the cars are drive driving all right so as I started exploring um, this navigation toolbox one of the things that that quickly like I mentioned it, it was really um, full featured in the sense that there are many, many examples, many different functions. And I started, you know, uh, exploring and navigating the space. And this was a, a very quick, you know, uh, autonomous drive around my basement. Um, you can sort of see the hockey nets over here um, and, and taking different scans along the way. And this was, you know, the initial um, vector that I, I went down just to see, can I use something like this? Because as, as it's going around the circle, 
every single progressive LIDAR scan that it took, it would then fuse it and add it to this, you know, the, these objects that they've created and come up with a refined pose estimate. And, and this worked really well offline. Um, as I started to develop it online very quickly, you know, the data became overwhelming and, and I'd have uh, a bit of challenges in keeping up with the multitudes of scans that I was having. So it wasn't really, you know, configured in a way to, to be implemented in real time or, you know, in online as the as the vehicle uh, was progressing. So, you know, I was a little concerned at this point saying, well, maybe I maybe this is going to be harder than I thought of, uh, of trying to achieve a global frame uh, in real time. Um, luckily, with, with more uh, digging and more investigation, I found uh, this one particular uh, algorithm. It's, uh, here's the reference from the, from the MathWorks toolbox um, from a paper that was just published you know, only a few years ago at the ICRA conference in 2016. But it basically did exactly what I wanted. And, and the benefit was that it was also uh, code generation compatible, meaning I could implement it in my uh, Simulink diagram generate optimized C code for it and have it be part of my real-time uh, application. Um, for, for future reference, and we'll send out this uh, webinar, the, the function is match uh, scan grids, which basically takes you know a, a relative, two relative LiDAR scans and tries to give a pose estimate of one re relative to the other. That's, that's essentially what my goal was, and, um, and that's what I set out to do. Here's my zoomed out version of the actual application that I eventually uh, ended up developing, and I'll go through uh, the important components of it um, one by one, just to, to highlight sort of my progression. But you know, before I do that, um, here is my my one of my first sort of what I like to call success videos. So what I'm doing here is just for now a single car, and I using the um, that function. What you can see here on the bottom right is a map of my sort of my initial uh, scan or my uh, my base frame. Um, that's that's the first scan that it takes as it runs this application, and then it it the application and I'll describe it. Every progressive scan through that will compare that particular scan with this base frame scan. What I've also done over here is just highlight the location estimate of that. So you can see this little blob over on the left side. That is the position and orientation of the car as it drives through the, that space and corrects its progressive scans to that base reference frame scan. And this little uh, other thing here is uh, my poll that it's seeing. So, you know, it's doing a decent job at it. And I'll, uh, you know, so this was the first succession I was able to get one car to localize in, in the global frame. And now I want to, to see if I can get two cars uh, in that frame. Um, so here is the actual algorithm. It's, it's fairly straightforward. I have my LiDAR, LiDAR data coming uh, from the car. This gets updated at, uh, I'm, I'm scanning it at about 20 Hertz. Um, and then I feed that into this function over here, which basically is just a embedded MATLAB function that takes that other, um, the function that, that I described earlier and generates the code for it in real time and basically gives me a relative pose of the current scan, which is distance two, to the reference frame scan, which is always distance one. Oh, some other uh, features here. It gives me a score sort of that tells me how, how well it's doing. So if it has a poor uh, relative pose, then I'll be able to uh, do something about that or, or ignore it, if, if you will. And then this is a, a parameter that I was able to, to change. This basically gives me my resolution in, you know, how many, uh, how big's the grid, you know, uh, in this space. So this basically gives me a 10 centimeter resolution um, over here. All right, so the, you know, once I have, uh, I implemented that and it, it was working quite well, unfortunately at that resolution, which I found, you know, uh, to, to be, to, to be uh, you know well performant, um, I was only able to extract pose real pose data at four hertz. So clearly that's not enough to to localize my system, um, you know, with the car driving at the speeds that it drives at. And so I had to fuse that data with something else. And luckily, uh, my colleagues on the call had provided me with what we call the uh, bicycle model of uh, of the vehicle. Basically, the bicycle model will take um, 
the actual car speed. So the Q car has an encoder that measures the its its actual uh, odometry speed. Um, so that's a high you know high resolution uh, speed sensor over here. We also have an IMU on the vehicle, um, and so I extract the the yaw gyroscope data there, um, and then by fusing. The, the car speed with the gyroscope data and, and given the parameters, the physical sort of kinematics of the car, I get what we're calling a pose dot. So pose dot just tells me based on that model and the information of my speed of my odometry and my gyro, you know, a, a prediction of how fast uh, my vehicle is going. And then I fuse that using a complementary filter with the slower pose sort of correcting correction term to get my pose estimate. And that's really what I'm using as my states of the system x y and and yaw uh, or heading and that's what uh you know th this is sort of giving me that sensor output of fusing real pose data at a slow rate with um predicted pose dot or relative uh rates based on our model and internal sensors then i implemented a fairly straightforward you know state system this has two states it's either achieved its goal or it's driving towards this goal so fairly straightforward system that this avoided any you know jitter or or uh, indecisiveness of the algorithm once it got to a target location within a successful radius then it completed its mission and it was ready for its next command or next destination so finally um you know i i looked at now, uh, how do I get that information back and forth to two vehicles? So we saw it working with one vehicle, and what I did was deploy the same code, the same algorithm, because I had a fixed uh, reference frame that I took with one of my vehicles. I took that picture or that uh, LiDAR scan of my space, and I deployed it on two different vehicles, and all I did was on vehicle one, if you want to call that my leader or my you know car one, and, and you can architect this in many different ways, but this is just one simple example of it. I have a server block, so you have a very simple uh, client server application. So my server running on car one would basically send commands to car two and receive the position of car two back and do something about it. And uh, conversely, on car two, it would it would send its position, so x y, and this is car two x y that it gets on the other side and receive. A destination commands and let's see how that sort of works out when i implemented uh, the algorithm on both both vehicles so here's my my first test um you see so i'm, I'm basically trying to get them to to go to all you know crisscross paths and they do and well, we had a crash so obviously i didn't implement any obstacle avoidance so even though the information is there and i'll play this again you can see um, car one and car two are there. Um, and then when I change the goal, they both go off and do their thing, but they're not, even though they know each other, where each other are, I'm not doing anything about it. And so that's obviously you know, something I should have done, but, or, or can do. Um, but also I, I want to pause here and just reflect on the fact that they, these vehicles and, and essentially everything Quanser provides you as researchers, will only do what you tell them to do. So if I don't tell them to avoid obstacles, they're not going to avoid obstacles. And, and nowhere in my code here do I consider the fact that, hey, these two um, cars are very close to one another. And, and even you know better than that, I could have also had a motion planning algorithm that could have predicted that their paths will cross and, and you know mitigate that ahead of time. So you know what uh, hopefully one big takeaway from, from what you're seeing here is, the information is there, the communications are there, um, and you know it's really uh, on, on you and, and your the direction of your research group of what you do with that information. If you want to look at um, you know centralized uh, uh, commands or a centralized system or infrastructure system that you know uh, changes the motion planning based on information from the different vehicles, or you can have different algorithms. You can have obviously obstacle avoidance algorithms on the vehicle. There's plenty of sensors, so I, I could have easily used a multitude of the sensors on the car to detect other cars or other objects in the way. Plus, I also know where each other are. I'm sending that data back and forth from vehicle to vehicle, so I could have done something about it. I just didn't in this particular instance. So I, I tuned the algorithm a little bit in some of my my settings. Um, tried it again and and got another crash. It, but I'm making progress, even though that doesn't look like it. I uh, one other thing to take away uh, from this is 
especially with our research grade or, or research centered uh, solutions, we do sweat the details. You know, we don't uh, advise you to crash these cars often, but you know, rest assured that things will happen and these cars will hit each other, um, especially if you get a, a swarm of them into your research space. And and you know, you you can uh, you can trust that they're going to be robust and and yeah. Uh, you know, continue to perform even if you have a hiccup here or there. And finally, um, you know, after a bit more time, a bit more tuning of of the system, I was able to at least have the vehicles not cross paths. So that was great. And got to this point, got really excited, saying, "All right, let's let's try that again. Let's see, you know, this if this you know push the envelope of this algorithm." And lo and behold, finally, I hit that pole in the middle. At some point, I was going to hit that pole, and and I didn't, uh, you know, I I see it in my scan, and I could have avoided it, but I did not tell the car to avoid the pole, and you know, lo and behold, it uh, it hit the pole. Um, so, you know, in summary, and I hope, uh, you know, from my my experience there and and walking through it, um, here's some things that I'd love for you to to reflect on, and and please, you know, I'd love for for you to ask us questions as uh, as we open up the floor in a, in a few minutes. You know, this is what I learned, and and like I said, you know, the fact that we're not in the common space, and I don't have the expertise of my team, um, you know, working alongside me like like we've always done uh, in our labs at Quanser. Um, you know, there were some challenges, obviously, <laughs> that that I was facing. Luckily, I was able to to overcome them. Um, but uh, you know, this is really where having such a powerful research studio, you know. Luckily, at in my basement, at the, at my fingertips, allowed me to explore and 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 you know really increase my understanding of uh, this space, especially on the uh, leveraging the navigation toolbox, for example. Um, so yeah, so in summary, uh, what I learned is global la and, uh, localization is quite hard. It's uh, you know I think theoretically, I I thought it would be a little easier. Um, turns out in practice, as as most things are, isn't uh, is a little bit more challenging. Um, the other thing that uh, you know I, I really enjoyed was uh, navigating the navigation toolbox and really investigating the many examples and utilities that uh, come there, and, and I look forward to, to doing even more so there. Um, and yeah, and again, as 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 much as it was ambitious, I believe in in trying to accomplish the task, and there's a lot more that I could do with this uh, you know this this application to build upon it. Um, you know, I was able to get a fixed global reference frame that both cars could uh, communicate with one another. Um, I was able to extract the robust pose location, so that you know that that was really key to me is uh, having an ability to do that online in real time. Uh, albeit right now the implementation is is fairly slow. I'd love to get that uh, considerably higher, but uh, and we have some ideas how to get there. Right now I'm only getting about you know four hertz of uh, of updates, which is uh, you know a little uh, too slow for the speeds I want to go at. Um, I was able to fuse that data successfully with my, um, you know, with my internal uh, model and then leveraging the internal sensors of the of the car. Um, I, I think I can improve that fusion as well. Um, and then, the, you know, I think uh, another big takeaway just had the relative ease of communication uh, from one vehicle to the other. Plus, the, you know, in general, all of our autonomous systems. Um, you know, we really highlight the communication capabilities because we believe that's a that's a big component of where this research um, environment can go and what the the trends in this research is is the ability not just to in, to locally, you know, be smart and autonomous, but to then communicate that information to the the larger world around you. Obviously, there's going to be you know an, a wide array of of uh, interconnected. Uh, devices and systems around. Um, you can only imagine in a, in a dense space, uh, you know, a dense city, for example. And then you, how do you actually efficiently organize that data, transport it, communicate it, um, to get you know as safe and e effective uh, autonomy as possible. Next steps. Just uh, I'm sure you know, as as all researchers, there's always uh, something else to do, and I, I this is just a, uh, an initial laundry list of things that I'd love to be doing. Uh, you know, on on my research studio that I'm, uh, you know, have the the benefit of having in my uh, basement slash hockey hockey rink that my kids aren't happy that I've taken over. Um, but yeah, so the next steps for me in in this particular you know uh, application would be to improve the performance. So like I was saying, the you know the the four hertz that I'm getting right now isn't ideal. Um, and I think if I, I we have some ideas, uh, you know, one one thing that I want to investigate is how do we deploy that code onto the GPU. 
and and there are tools like the GPU coder, and we have uh, some other methodologies, maybe using Python uh, or or going back to to the ROS environment and trying to really push uh, you know that that you know scan matching or relative pose algorithm onto the GPU so I could leverage the power of the GPU to give a performance boost there. Um, another option, you know, I do have a ground control station here that is a fairly highly performant, uh, you know, PC. Can I do more in terms of processing the data on that system? Uh, that's also a possibility and, and allows me to sort of to really investigate that vehicle to infrastructure elements that you could implement. I can definitely tune my fusion algorithm. I mean, this was, uh, you know, you can sort of see it in, in the videos. Um, the There is a, a, a bit of a lag. Uh, obviously, the, the pose... The real pose data comes in at a very slow rate, and uh, my fusion, uh, I think, is a bit too skewed to uh, maintain that as well. So it sort of gets delayed a little bit, uh, or more so than I'd like. Um, improve the filtering and the bias removal. I mean, these are just bread and butter type stuff that that I should have been doing. Uh, that, you know, I can do. Um, obviously, collision avoidance. I was not implementing any co collision avoidance, and that that could have been a fairly easy way to avoid. Um, you know. The, uh, the collisions that we we had, and then at some point I gotta remove this darn pole from in the middle of my nice uh, workspace that I have over here. Um, and finally, I just want to give you an inside uh, view of of what's coming down the pipe along the self driving car research studio, and then we'll open it up to to questions. So here is the, another you know application that we've developed on uh, on the car. So it's a simple or, or you know fairly straightforward uh, lane keeping algorithm. Again, this is me driving around uh, the basement. This is with one of our, our roadways here, um, and, and the you know this is this is all part of the package. But I think one thing to to keep in mind um, as we're developing this, and one thing that we've released uh, recently at Quantzer, and if you haven't checked it out, check out our our, our webpage at Quantzer.com. You can see that we're really uh, exploring and and re and releasing many um, offerings within the. Uh, virtual space and this has been really powerful for me so as i'm developing some of these algorithms uh, right now we've implemented our virtual mobile robot and uh, is what you're seeing over here but the way that we've you know our our approach to virtualization is a very hardware centric approach meaning the code that i'm running on my virtual mobile robot is the exact same code that I can deploy even down to the axis of the IO, the axis of the sensor data, same code that I can deploy on the physical system. And this duality of going back and forth from physical to you know virtual and then back um, is quite powerful and really helped me uh, you know, in this particular application. And I can only imagine uh, many more as we uh, fill that out. So you can see early in the new year, our vision is to take our complete self-driving car research studio with the Q car and provide a virtual twin um, experience uh, akin to the physical one. So this way you can do both. You can have your research group work on physical, uh, you know, environment. Uh, again, I, you know, if, if my experience is, is any uh, um, observation as well, it, nothing will ever replace the physical nuance there's always something that comes up that you just simply cannot simulate you simply can't virtualize um, and there's a lot of uh, power in that so, you know not just for teaching but for research as well but you know let's not forget that there's also a lot of things you can do very well in the virtual space and so that duality of going back and forth from a vir virtual experience to the physical um, is quite profound and, and something that i think uh, post pandemic we should benefit from and uh, and make sure we implement uh, both options. It's not one or the other, but one and the other. And then finally, you know, as as we develop a more robust uh, localization system, we can start doing more things like this. So what I'm showing here is a mixed reality experience. So the car physically on the top left there is driving in an open lab space. But what we've done is we've interjected a virtual cityscape into the sensor suite of the vehicle. So as far as the vehicle is concerned, it is seeing both the real and the physical, uh, sorry, the, and, and the virtual. And so, um, you know, the uh, we're looking at at ways to really push the envelope in terms of this architecture and this uh, type of approach to to really, you know, again, push the boundaries of what you can do in both the physical and virtual space.
with that, I'll, I'll end uh, the webinar over here. Uh, you know, hopefully uh, you found it interesting, and and uh, I'm hopeful I'm hopeful that you had some uh, some good questions to to ask and and to uh, to see what uh, you know if you have any any more uh, interest in, in what what I was doing and what capabilities of the self driving car research studio. Uh, another big takeaway I hope you you take from from this and from other interactions with Quanser is we truly view you know our customers view Quanser as colleagues and not simply vendors. I hope, you know, what I was able to show you is just like you, I, I also do the research and I also like to, to push my understanding and experience of what's out there and what's emerging in this uh, in these exciting areas. Um, and, and we love doing that. We love being researchers as well as suppliers of research equipment. Uh, and we hope to continue that, uh, you know, with you uh, along the way. And with that, I will end the, the webinar and open up the floor to to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. That was uh, that was great. Um, um, yes, we have a couple of questions that have uh, come in. First question: um, Is it possible to implement uh, multi-agent rendezvous algorithms with this system? Yeah. So so that's a that's a great question. Um, and, and you know, I, I'm not particularly you know. Uh, up to speed exactly what you mean by by rendezvous but i can only imagine that uh, it, it's some uh, architecture topology where you know one vehicle follows the other or meets uh, the other at a given location at a given time that kind of uh, application and and by all means you know i think if there's one thing hopefully you can take away from what my experience and and you know other quantum experiences on the research side of, of our solutions is really you know your imagination will be your limit i mean I, I say that with all honesty in the sense that it is an open architecture system it's an open canvas open platform so just like i didn't consider obstacles and i hit obstacles because i didn't consider them you can implement any logic any type of um, control architecture any type of uh, motion planning environment or or uh, approach that you want you know, and as long as the, the the vehicle is has the sensors, which which we try to do, and has all that information, I see no reason why you can't uh, really you know develop uh, forward-looking applications like a rendezvous, uh, for example. So hopefully that addressed the question. Uh, next question: What is the position accuracy of the vehicles? Yeah, so so that's a, a, a great question. Um, so. You know, the, in this particular application, what I did was I used that uh, sort of that pose correction, uh, the the lidar scan matching uh, algorithm that I described, um, and to get that to even perform at the rate that I wanted it. So at the four four hertz, I was able to tune it uh, to have you know. So that was a, a function parameter, and so I set it at for this case 10 centimeters. So right now it's plus minus 10 centimeters is the sort of global position accuracy. But the bicycle model is a lot more uh, precise, you know, in terms of its estimate. So I have high precision there, but obviously it's not accurate to reality because you know that that comes in at uh, plus or minus 10 centimeters currently. But you know that uh, again, it's, it's up to you, your research and, and whatever application you're developing. Uh, next question is: uh, Is there any room for additional payload on the Q car? So on the cue card itself, as we can see in the image here, there is um, this acrylic sheet where you could potentially mount uh, additional sensors. Um, as well, the breadboard has additional I.O. Um, you can connect um, encoders, uh, SBI sensors, uh, I2C sensors. And so I would imagine if your sensor was anywhere between like 100 and 200 grams, um, you would be OK. Um, mounting it on the cue car with the only thing to keep in mind being the battery capacity. So the more sensors you've got on board, you've got additional weight, but also just drawing more from the battery itself. So depending on what you like to do, it might just diminish the battery life a little bit, but definitely uh, doable. Just like with all of our solutions, then being open architecture and then you having access to those pinouts via Quark. Um, like Paul mentioned, it's, it's your imagination and, and would you like to add to extend the application of the vehicle? Uh, next question is, um, is there, an, and I think you you somewhat addressed this, uh, uh, Paul, in your presentation, is there an enforcement mechanism to maintain braking distance between two cars in close proximity to each other? 
Yeah, and and uh, you know, if you look at some of our other blogs and other videos uh, and webinars in the past that really talk about sort of using the uh, using the set, the cameras as as the main sensor. So we have the RGBD camera there, as well as the other uh, CSI cameras, and and obviously the lidar can detect it as well. So we we definitely can detect obstacles in other vehicles. I uh, and we've implemented many applications that take that into consideration and and avoid any collisions and keep a safe distance from one vehicle to the other. Um, I simply deleted those in my, uh, when I was uh, developing my application um, because I you know I, I wanted to really push the envelope uh, on one particular area. But definitely we have many examples that do just that. Um, and it's really, again, it's it, it will do whatever you tell it to do. So you have that information. And if your algorithm says stay within a meter, then it will stay within a meter. I'm getting a lot of questions um, asking whether uh, you will provide the uh, models and codes uh, to the audience. Definitely. So uh, all our all our content in general, I mean, everything that we release at Quanser uh, all the time is freely available. So if you just go to Quanser.com and, and look at the courseware section um, or content section, you will find a multitude of, of different collections of content and code and, and examples and documentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, around all our all our systems, and so the self-driving car research studio has a, a wealth of uh, uh, content around it. And, and as we develop more, we definitely will be adding it to those packages. Um, in the meantime, yeah, you can reach out to us as well if you want a particular example that you might not uh, know where to find it, and we'll definitely uh, make sure you you, you receive it. Um, one of the attendees is asking whether the room, um, in addition to the car, is instrumented. Yeah, so uh, it, that, that's a really good question. Um, so part of the self-driving car research studio, so you sort of see a, a visualization here of it, um, we decided not to provide a localization system. Our, our other uh, research studio, the uh, the drone research studio, comes with a uh, OptiTrack or motion capture localization system. Um, and for that in particular, because the drones are, are moving in 3D space, and uh, you know they do not have a lidar uh, on them, and and you know it, it it was a lot more critical for for those that type of research to you know have a high frequency uh, real uh, knowledge of, of where each drone is. So conversely, on the self-driving car research studio, you have you know a multitude of cars. Our our vision is is you know. Uh, many cars or, or a set of cars in the space. You have the ground control station. You have a high performance, uh, you know, Wi-Fi uh, environment or architecture that they're all communicating with one another. <clears throat> but the localization, um, because it has, you know, 360 cameras, it's got the front-facing RGBD and the lidar. Um, we believed, uh, you know, our hypothesis, and I believe we, we've sort of shown that that is true, um, is that there's a lot you can do with the onboard sensors you already have. And so we decided not to provide it um, with the package out of the box, but there's no reason why you can't uh, also instrument the room with a motion capture system to give you that information um, you know, more accurately, for example. That would have definitely helped me quite a bit uh, instead of trying to do that uh, myself. Um, or some other you know, examples, another idea that I'm floating around is a uh, you know, wide field of view camera that, that's instrumented at the, at the top or the roof of your uh, lab that can that can detect multiple um, agents as they drive around. So I think there's many options you could do, but out of the box, um, self-driving car research studio does not have a, a you know a room localization system unless you wanted to. Great, great. I have two last questions. Um, uh, one attendee is asking whether you have a reference uh, for how to implement the complementary filter that uh, that you've used in your uh, demo. Yeah, um, so that that's the same complementary filter, uh, funny enough, that we use on our drone as well. So on the in the drone uh, case, we have uh, a fairly noisy um, accelerometer reading that gives you a an indication of its uh, roll and pitch, and then we fuse that with a cleaner uh, gyro data that gives you roll and pitch yaw, and then we fuse those two signals together to give us. A, an attitude or a pose of the drone as it's flying around. So I basically just used that same complementary filter and I tuned it, but uh, we can definitely, uh, if you reach out to us, you can also find it on the, the drone package. Um, and I believe it's also in the uh, some of the bicycle model packages that we have um, with 
with the self-driving car research studio but uh, if you if you have trouble finding it on our website please reach out to us and we'll make sure uh, we provide it to you and the final question is given that the Q car has the ability to uh, uh, self-localize how can uh, we use it to develop driving policies to help us progress uh, to level three and four autonomy yeah well thank you for the for that question as well so um, you know one of the things I really wanted uh, to convey and hopefully uh, a, a takeaway you you see from this is because of the the variety of communication <clears throat> one could implement with the system, be it vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure, you could really start investigating what kind of policies, what kind of architectures and topologies would one of these systems, you know, when you actually uh, send it out to the in the real world, need to have. You know, what are some governing um, protocols, what are some governing um, applications or sort of rules of, uh, of motion that you can implement, you know, over and above the communication of these vehicles with one another and the infrastructure that could help, you know, reach the, the challenging goals, honestly, of uh, regulations of, you know, I, I, you, you saw when I was developing them and I was having collisions, that's definitely not what you want in real life. And, and you have to, um, you know, push the envelope of, you know, overly, uh, you know, making these things safe. But our goal with this, because it's open and has the communications capabilities, you can start progressing towards that direction. You know, what kind of information, what kind of states, what kind of uh, logic can you implement on, on many levels and topologically, uh, communications-wise, to get to the, the various uh, regulatory requirements to, to eventually deploy these algorithms uh, in real cars. Um, sorry, I have one last question that just came in, um, uh, and uh, the attendee is asking whether the Q car um, can tow a passive trailer. Is that possible? So I'll, I'll pass that back on to John. That's uh, I, that's a new question. I've, I've never heard that one before, so it's, uh, I'm intrigued. But John, do you have any any thoughts on that? That would be interesting. Um, you would have to figure out a way of mounting the, the trailer to the back of the cue car, maybe attaching it to um, the aluminum frame. Um, I don't see why that's not possible, um, but I I think that if, if you have a way of mounting it and having some sort of info about the, the location of the trailer, uh, just passively, yeah, I, I, I think that's doable. Interesting question, I like it. We'd love to see it done, yeah, and please, if you have uh, an idea of, a, we'd love to hear what exactly you're thinking of, and uh, like I said, we, we love to collaborate with researchers, and, and I, you know, nothing, uh, I, I get really excited when I see uh, customers do things with our products that we never thought thought of ourselves, so that's, that's always uh, exciting for us to see. Well, uh, th thanks, uh, uh, Paul. That was a, that was a great uh, presentation, and a, a big thank you to all our attendees. Um, for additional information on the uh, self uh, driving Car Research Studio, I invite you to visit our website at www.quanser.com. Uh, have a wonderful day and stay safe.